Turn, uh, so we're going to be there in the book of Daniel. And right there in verse 7, it says, All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors and the princes, the counselors and the camp captains have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for 30 days, save of thee, O king, he shall be cast in the den of lions. And so the title of the message this uh, afternoon is How to Biblically Deal with Censorship. How to Biblically Deal with Censorship. The Bible actually gives us many examples of censorship or silencing those that are preaching the Word of God and how we can deal with it. And Daniel is a great example. I mean, you can, you can go through the entire Bible and we can see it all the way from the beginning. I mean, censorship isn't always just telling someone not to speak the Word of God. Censorship is also not including certain things in the Word of God. So, for example, in Genesis, when the devil or the serpent tempts uh, Eve, he omits certain things from the Word of God. He censored them. He, uh, he was a filter for them. And so how we biblically deal, and you know, Daniel 6 is the famous story of Daniel and the lion's den, and Daniel is a righteous man, and the king, uh, you know, has favor for him, and the other people don't like that, and what they end up doing is creating a law that forces the king to throw him into the lion's den, and we know at the end, Daniel comes out victorious, but there's a lot of lessons that we can see from this, and so that's what we're going to cover, and you say, well, pastor, you know, what is... Uh, censorship have to do with our church you know are we really being censored well maybe not uh directly at least not yet it's going to come but it doesn't matter if you're on a national stage or on a local stage or on a regional stage eventually censorship is going to come to the personal stage you know the bible speaks of the time when they will try to silence us for the word of god and many will lose their lives and there's going to be persecution and tribulations for that so it's just, a, it's just an important thing to learn about how to deal with people trying to silence you. You know, we're going to look at the big picture, but you can apply this to even just your personal life. You know, as you go out there and you preach the word to your friends and your family, some people are going to try to tell you not to preach the word of God, that you're being offensive or that you shouldn't say certain things or you shouldn't attack certain groups or you shouldn't speak against certain religions. I get that all the time when I'm out either soul winning or when I'm out traveling in business. People say, well, you shouldn't talk about politics and religion in, uh, in the work environment. Now, I don't know what politi politics have to do with it because I stopped talking about politics a long time ago, but they always, you know, isn't that the term that you hear? We can't talk about politics and religion in the work environment. You know, I always tell people, well, before, when, before I got saved, I always tell people those are the only two things that matter. Now that I, I've been saved for a long time and now that I preach the Word of God, the only thing that matters is preaching the Word of God. So let's go ahead and just start looking there. We're going to take a whole look at, uh, at the entire uh, chapter. We're going to look at all, all uh, uh, we're going to do a, a study of Daniel 6, but in context of what we're speaking of today, which is how to deal biblically with censorship. You know, you're there, and in verse 1 it says, It pleased Darius to set over the kingdoms and 120 princes, which should be over the whole kingdom, and over these three presidents of whom David was first, that the princes might give account, account unto them, and the king should have no damage. Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king thought to set him over the whole realm. And so the first thing we see here is that there's this hierarchy set up by the king, and that David is singled out for having an excellent spirit, And, he's, uh, and that he wants to put him in charge of everything. This is, this is very similar to Joseph being second in command in Egypt. And we're not going to, obviously, we're not going to read all the verses, but this is just to set this up. It says, then the presidents and princes, so you have 120, I mean, 119, 120 princesses, or 19, right, minus Daniel, and then uh, two presidents, because he said three presidents over them, right? Uh, where was that? And three presidents, of one of whom was Daniel. So we have two presidents. All the presidents of the king, uh, I'm sorry. Then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom. But they could find none occasion or fault. For as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. And, you know, here's an interesting thing. You know, when people want to argue the Bible, one of the main arguments they want to do and the one of the ways they want to censor 
you know, the gospel message is they're like, well, that's in the New Testament and that's in the Old Testament. Well, this is a picture of Jesus in the Old Testament. I mean, think about it. He's an excellent spirit. He's been he's going to be uh, set over the kingdom. They want to attack him concerning the kingdom. They couldn't find fault. Uh, you know, Jesus came without no sin because he was faithful. And neither was there any error or fault found in him. So what do they have to do? Well, they're going to do what they did to Jesus. They're going to make something up. Now here, they're going to make an actual rule that Daniel has to break. With Jesus, they just brought a false testimony, but we see that foreshadowing. And it says there in uh, verse 5, that says, Then said these men, We shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. They knew that Daniel was so committed to the word of God that he wouldn't break it no matter what. They're already thinking they're wise in the world. They're wise in the, words of, in the ways of the world. They're, they're sneaky, right? What they're doing is they're basically figured out, hey, this guy, he's going to preach it till the day that Jesus comes or his death. And so what we need to do is find a way for him to have a law that will force him to break that law, man's law, because he's not going to break God's law. And so before we get to the, you know, let's just keep reading up to the verse 7, and then we'll set this up. It says, uh, verse 6, that said, Then these presidents and princes assembled together to the king and said thus unto him, King Darius, live forever. Here's the thing that we're going to see. We're going to see flattery. The world's going to, you know, basically kiss this guy's feet. They're going to grovel at his feet and say, look, you're the king. Live forever. They don't really care about King Darius, but they know they need to get on his good side in order to get things done. And that's how it's going to be, you know, as time uh, goes on. You know, these fake Christians that, for example, today get behind someone like a Donald Trump or get behind these big corporations. They, they get behind these corporations and they say, you know, it's OK for YouTube to silence you. You know, if you've got nothing to hide, then then you're not going to get silenced. If you've got if you're not doing anything wrong, if you're following the guidelines, then you're OK. And then they're going to use the Bible to say that we got to follow the law. But the Bible tells us it is better to obey God than to obey man. Right. So we see this set up and then verse seven, which is what we just read, says all the presidents of the kingdom, the governors and the princes, the counselors and the captains have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any God or man. And you notice they capitalized that because they knew they were they were pointing directly at, at, at the man of God for 30 days. Save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. They even gave it a timeline because they knew that within 30 days, most people would buckle. You know, Christianity around there would say, you know what, we're not going to break the laws for 30 days. And then 30 days, we'll just go back to being who we are. You know, it's kind of like churches today. They'll just follow the guidelines and do just enough. You know, 20 years ago, it was popular to preach against the sodomites and preach against hard sins and preach against the bad things of this world. But as television and the media and Hollywood have gone behind this agenda and politics, those same preachers aren't preaching that anymore. It's required that a new generation come and preach the word of God holy in spite of what might happen. And so the very first point that I want to make here today is that you need to know what you stand for. You need to have your foundation set at the right place. You know, if you don't know what you stand for, you're going to fall for anything. You know, if they, you know that saying goes, you know, if you don't stand for any, something, you're going to fall for anything. And so you need to know what you stand for. Keep your finger in Daniel 6, but go to Colossians 1. Go to Colossians 1. And in the meantime, I'll just read for you a couple of verses. If you skip down to verse, you know, I'll read for you verse 9 of Daniel. But go to Colossians. Go to Colossians 1. And then right there it says, Wherefore King Darius signed the writing and decree. And then in verse 10 it says, Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being opened in his chamber towards Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. You know, the Bible tells us to pray in secret. But Daniel knew there was a law against the God Almighty. And you know what? He was going to let the world know that he was not going to bow to anybody but Jesus Christ. To bow to anybody but God Almighty. God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And Colossians 1 tells us, you know, this is our, the foundation. Daniel knew his foundation. Daniel knew where he stood in his life. He knew that this life was a vapor and it didn't matter if he lost it for God's sake. What he needed to do was serve God. And in Colossians 1 verse 15 he says, Who is the image of the invisible God, 
the firstborn of every creature, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him, in him should all fullness dwell, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If ye continue in faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard and which was preached to every creature which is, in, which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. I mean, I love those verses because it covers everything on the gospel. The blood, you know, the preeminence that he built the world, that he has the power, that we're reconciled, that we, you know, that we have been made whole. And then right there it says, and if you continue in faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard, in which was preached to every creature which is under heaven. So he's saying, look, you need to be grounded and settled. Look, if you're grounded, but you're on faulty ground, you're going to shift. So you need to have the right ground, the right rock, which is Jesus Christ, and then you need to be grounded in that rock. You know, you can be on top of a, the perfect foundation, but then you can build the house of straw, and it'll still fall. But you want to build that, that house of the strongest material that you can. Well, our spiritual house is built on the rock that's Jesus Christ. So the first thing we need to know is we need to know what we stand for. How do we deal with uh, censorship biblically? How do we deal with them silencing us through social media, through the schools, through work, through the uh, politics, through the, you know, whatever it is, through our families? We need to know what we stand for. We need to know where we're going to draw that line. We need to know what our foundation is, right? And Daniel knew that in verse 7. And then in verse 9, he, I mean in verse 10. Now skip down. You know, we see this going on. They, they signed this thing, and, and now Daniel's praying. So now they have something against Daniel. Now they can point this out. And verse 14 says, Then the king, when he heard these words, so now they accuse Daniel of breaking the law that they convinced the king to do. See, they, they, they went and they got on the right side of the king by flattering him, by saying, Oh, king, you know, live forever. They, they probably said he was the greatest king. They, you know, they, they, they basically, you know, kissed the ground he walked on. And then, so the king wasn't thinking logically. He was emotional because remember, he likes Daniel. But he, he did not see the deception and the lie and the manipulation of these princesses and presidents when they came and proposed this law. What they did is they appealed to what? His ego. Does that sound familiar? to these false Christians that are appealing to Donald Trump? I mean, isn't Donald Trump probably the most egotistical maniac that has walked the presidential face of this earth? I thought Barack Obama was bad. And I mean, I, I did not like Barack I Obama. I don't, I don't know that I've liked the president for a long time. But I mean, Donald Trump is about as arrogant and as pompous as they come. I mean... Forget all the politics and the rhetoric, just the fact that he brags about everything. I mean, the Bible says that we need to be humble. It says the, that pride causes destruction, the haughty spirit is a fall. You know, it, it gives us all that. And, we con and he continuously keeps bragging and saying, you know, how great he is and everything. We see this. They appeal to Darius' ego, right? And then it caught him off guard. It I mean, he made a mistake and he knew it. And verse 14 says, Then the king, when he heard these words, was sore displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored till the going of the sun to deliver him. Why is he laboring? Look, if, he, if it's his law and he didn't, you know, he wanted everybody to worship him, it would have been easy for him to just deliver him. But he labored because he knew he got duped. It wasn't so much that 
Daniel broke the law, but also that he figured out that they manipulated him to this law. He put two and two together. He's like, man, these guys, they got me. And his ego was so big that he couldn't swallow his pride and back down and say, no, you know what? I'm going to change that law because I'm Darius. I'm the, I'm the ruler, the king. And Daniel's not going in. Because you know why? Because it would have made him look weak. And, in, 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 and I mean, not just in those times, in any time, anytime you're in a position of power, the last thing you want to do is look weak. Except if you're Jesus Christ, and then you'll just be the weakest of all, but in reality, you're the strongest of all. The perception was that they hung him on the cross. The reality was that he conquered death for us so that we could be freed. And that's why we won't be censorship and God's word won't be censorship because there's people that want to go to heaven. There's people that want to hear the word of God. You know, I mean, are we really doing that bad that people need to stop us from preaching the word of God? No, but the reality is that the devil wants to go out there and manipulate and censor and filter and stop the word of God so that more people will go to hell with him than not. So we see here, uh, the second point I want to make is, you know, be clear, be clear and don't straddle. It sounds like the first point, but number one is know your foundation. But sometimes we know things, but we don't always know how to explain things, right? You know, I knew for a long time that, you know, we came to this country for opportunity and stuff, but I couldn't always explain myself like that, right? And then when I got saved, I knew that I got saved, but for a long time I couldn't explain the gospel message clearly. I could tell people that, you know, I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, and that you know I was saved and I was going to heaven, but then when they kind of pressed me and gave me a few a few verses or arguments against it that I wasn't prepared for, you know I just couldn't I wasn't clear, and so sometimes you would sway one way or the other or just say things to make people leave you alone. But here I'm telling you, be be clear and don't straddle. What do I mean by straddle? Well, sometimes when you get stuck, instead of sticking to your guns, you kind of you kind of take that side. I remember when I first got saved, you know, and I wasn't that strong against the sodomites against these, uh, these sissy men and women that go around doing all kinds of inconvenient things, these fags, these queers, you know what I, I would say is, look, as long as they leave me alone and I leave them alone, you know, I don't agree with that lifestyle, but, uh, you know, let them do whatever they want. But the more you read the word of God, he says, look, the law says that they should be put to death. And if you had a righteous government, they would put them to death, right? Not me, not you. Not anybody in this room, but if we had a righteous government, they'd do that. Just like they put psychopaths on, uh, on death row and they put them to death. So, you know, we have to be clear and not to straddle. And so as we grow in God's word, we have to figure out, is this a point that I need to move into one direction or the other? Is this a point that I have to make, take a stand on? You know, am I going to take a stand on a clear gospel message? Well, you know, they said repent, but they didn't really mean repent like you under. Look, don't say that. Don't even confuse the issue. The Bible says it's by faith alone through Jesus Christ. It's a gift of God. Right? It says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So there, you can't even stop sinning. Right? Let's be clear. So go. you don't have to go there. Just stay there in Daniel. We see there in, in, uh, in Daniel, uh, in Matthew 5, 37, it says, but let your communication be yea, yea, Nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than this, than these, cometh evil. In other words, you know, I'm not going to read that whole chapter, but this verse is saying, look, let people know where you stand. If, if it's yes, then say yes. And if it's no, then say no. Be transparent. But you, you know how it is. You run into people, and what does it say? But whatsoever is more than these, cometh evil. You know, and um, it, it's like the examples of sometimes people are like, Oh, well, oh, okay, so you believe like that? Well, I didn't say I believed exactly like that. What I was really trying to say was that, you know, and, and then they give you this long, look, just, it is what it is. Yes, yes, no, no. You know, I do that with my business all the time. I do that with my life. People tell me, well, you shouldn't preach against the sodomites. Well, God told me to preach against the sodomites. You know, someone recently told me that it was a family member. They told me that I should... Uh, I said, oh, don't, they were apologizing to me for something that happened years ago. And I said, oh, don't worry about it. I'm not even offended. And they said, well, I'm your family. I would hope you would feel offended. And I said, well, sorry to disappoint you. But God says that if I'm a Christian and I believe in his word, then I shouldn't be offended. So I'm not offended. 
I'm pretty clear on that. You know, and if you don't know how to be clear, then just at least back down and stay silent, and at least you're clear on God's word. Right? Let them know that you stand for God's word. And we already read verse 10, but I just wanted to use that again because Daniel was clear. He didn't straddle. He says, now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before God as he did a four time. You know, if you were driving down the street, even if it was far away and you saw someone in front of their window kneeling down praying, you'd notice it. Even if you didn't say anything, you would you would be a little nosy. That's the human nature, right? He did it so that everybody could see. He says, look, I don't care what the law is. I don't care who Darius is. I don't care that I'm second in command or that I'm the most esteemed or that I'm getting paid well or that I live in the palace. I serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Now at the time in the Old Testament, Jesus hadn't come. They knew they were serving the Messiah, the Savior of the world. For us, it's Jesus Christ. But that's who we need to serve. Point number three, so you need to know what you stand for. You need to have your foundation grounded. You need to have that rock in your life. And then you need to be clear about your message and don't straddle. You know, don't straddle the fence. Don't be one way or the other. The Bible talks about being lukewarm and how Jesus will, you know, God will spew you out. Let's go to uh, 2 Corinthians. And by the way, just keep your finger in Daniel. We're going to keep coming back to Daniel. Go to 2 Corinthians uh, 11. And number three is that we have to understand the enemy. Many times the enemy seems harmless. As a matter of fact, the enemy will come at you harmless. You know, the, the kings came to Darius appealing to his better side, to his ego. But we have to know our enemy. We have to know who we're dealing with. And we have to know, like Daniel, he, didn't, he knew the enemy because he knew that God had overcome the enemy. Right? But if you read there in uh, 2 Corinthians 11, 2 Corinthians 11, and we're in verse 1, it says, Would you to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom ye have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. He's warning, Paul's warning them, saying, look, don't be like Eve, who heard God's word, she walked with God, but then the serpent came and fed her the line and removed, she didn't know it well enough to know that he had, he had fed it to her wrong. You know, people come to me all the time and they're like, well, doesn't the Bible say this, this, and that? I'm like, where? Show me. Well, didn't the Bible say, doesn't the Bible, didn't Jesus, didn't, you know, I mean, one of the most popular arguments you hear is that whole, you know, love the sin and hate the sinner. Most people don't even know that that comes from Muhammad Gandhi, who's burning in hell. That's nowhere found in the Bible. Nowhere in the Bible will you find love. Uh, or I, did I say that wrong, honey? My wife's looking at me. It's hate the sin, hate the sin, hate the sin. Let me let me because I hate the sin, hate I uh, love the sinner, hate the sin, love the sinner. So you know you heard that, and see I don't even want to memorize it correct, but the reality is we need to know how to fight the enemy. Hate the sin and love the sinner. And see, I hate the sinner just as much as I hate the sin. That's why I keep saying that. Because the Bible says that God hates the wicked every day. The reality is that God hates sinners. Why? How do we get to heaven? Because we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the blood of Jesus covered us. It's not because I'm that great of a guy. As a matter of fact, you know, you hang around with me long enough. I'm not that great. But thank God that I'm saved by grace through Jesus Christ. But on the other side of the coin, if I hang out with anybody long enough, I'm going to find all their faults. I mean, we can nitpick on people. But you know what God tells me? He says to esteem others better than myself, to find the love of them. But I'm off on a tangent because I messed that whole thing up. But, you know, he says here, look, know, know your enemy. 
he says, they're going to come at you. He says, if, if, for if that he cometh, preacheth another Jesus. So they're going to come at you with another Jesus, like the Mormons and the Jehovah Witnesses and the, the Jehovah's False Witnesses, right? And the, you know, the, the Mormons and the uh, Seventh-day Adventists, they come with another Jesus. It says, whom we have not preached, or you receive another spirit. Look, if you don't have the Holy Spirit in you, I hope you don't have another spirit in you because that's a wicked spirit. Which ye have not received or another gospel. They're perverting the word of God. You know, that's why we only use the King James Bible here in, at Springcrest. Because it's the word of God. Other, they're just perversions. It says, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. He's warning him. He says, don't be deceived like Eve. Don't turn on the television and you see fornication and you're like oh well that's normal everybody they don't suffer or people getting married uh you know having i mean i'm sorry children without wedlock and cohabitating without ever marrying well that's cool you know they have these great lives you know you turn on i remember watching movies and and the intro of the movies like this the the protagonist and they're they're going to the market and they have the perfect life and they have a great job and everybody loves them and all this stuff, and it turns out they're sleeping with a bunch of men or women. I mean, they're fornicating because that's what the world wants you to think is normal. That's deception. That's evil. Know your enemy. They're going to sell it to you good. Or you turn on the TV, and every other movie or every other show has a sodomite character. And, and, and he's not abusing little children, and he's not going through the psychopath process of, of, of uh, nurturing them and grooming them for abuse and, you know, uh, demise of their lives for years and years to come. No, they're cool. They're cultured and they know how to decorate. And, you know, the Bible says that's wicked. It says it's perverse, right? Or you get on, you know, whatever. Nowadays, you can't even get on Facebook without getting banned if you don't say the right things. You can't get on YouTube or any social media. You can't turn on the TV without hearing the, the lies. Go to... Uh, Galatians 1, and I'll read for you 1 Peter. 1 Peter 5, verse 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory in Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish you, strengthen, settle you. You guys see the theme here? We started out by saying, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. But then he says, but the God of all grace, who called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish you, strengthen you, settle you. So we need Christ, we need God to strengthen us, because the devil's after us. And he gets you. You know, he gets you in the ways that you never expect. He comes at you like Darius and he, he gets to the side that he knows is going to stroke your ego. In Galatians 1, verse 6, you know, I love uh, Galatians 1 because Paul's going on. He says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but that there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach another gospel unto you, then that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you that ye have received, let him be accursed. He says twice, let him be accursed for preaching a false gospel. For do, not, do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if it yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. See, Daniel said, I'm not going to please Darius. I'm not going to please men so that I can be a servant of Christ. You know, I mean, you got televangelist preachers. You got women preachers preaching, I mean, uh, preaching, uh, praying over Donald Trump. That's all, uh, that's not in the Bible anywhere. That, that's found nowhere in Scripture. That, that let them be accursed. You say, well, that sounds kind of harsh. God is harsh. Because he doesn't want you to go to hell. It's better for you to know the truth. The Bible actually describes him as a terrible God. See, because he loves you so much, 
he is terrible about sin. I love my children so much that I would be pretty terrible to somebody that would abuse them. If somebody came at our children to abuse them, I might not be as, uh, as nice as I, I can be sometimes. I, I'm pretty sure I'd be pretty terrible. To them, of course, not to you. But, you know, so we see this going on. So, you know, we, we see that we need to have our foundation. We know what to stand for. We need to be clear and not to straddle. We need to understand the enemy. You know, Daniel understood the enemy and, and just dealt with it, right? He, he's going, uh, and, and, what, and then what's the other point I'm trying to make? Once we understand the enemy, then it's not for us to stand by and watch. It's for us to go on the offensive. You know, Proverbs 28, one says, The wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are bold as a lion. You know, the wicked, they flee when no man pursues. It says, but the righteous are bold as a lion. Hebrew 13.5, stay there in Daniel. Hebrews 13.5 says, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have, for he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. So that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. That's a lot easier said than done. But you know what? If we're in the Word and we're renewing ourselves daily, we can face those challenges and tribulations. You know, our church is is a smaller church here in Houston. Our pastor, uh, he's, uh, Pastor Cobb is 82. We're going on 83. As the associate, I'm the one who's implemented, uh, you know, the, the YouTube channel and done the Facebook and uploaded the, the, the sermons on MP3 and video and all that stuff. But Pastor Cobb's been preaching hard for a long time, and his persecutions come in the form of what was commonly known back in the day. People just leave your church or talk about your church or different things. Now, eventually, someday, I'm pretty sure people will just attack us through the media or locally or through Facebook or YouTube because we're out there. You know, the Word of God is going to, it says, and yea, and all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But he says, don't fear man. Fear not what they're going to do to you because he's going to never leave you nor forsake you. So either we believe the promises of God or we don't, right? So let's go back to Daniel. And we're going to see there in verse 22. So first, you know, we need to understand, we need to go on the offensive. We need to preach the word of God, not only boldly, but more often and more frequently and everywhere we can and louder and harder than we've ever preached it before. And if you don't have that boldness, then ask God for that boldness. And if you don't understand how to do it, go with someone who knows how to do it and get trained. You know, I've been going to a lot of preacher conferences over the last two years. I'm going, one, to get fed and to get edified. But number two, I'm going to surround myself with others that are better than me so that I can learn how to be as bold and as strong as they can. There's nothing wrong with learning what you maybe didn't know how to do. I didn't grow up. A first or second. I mean, I didn't grow up a Baptist. I didn't grow up with the Word of God, you know, by my bedstand, you know, correctly. So I have to learn. The Bible tells us to study to show ourselves approved. Go to Daniel 6, and you're in verse 22. It says, My God hath sent an angel and hath shut the lion's mouth, that they have not hurt me, for as much as before him innocency was found in me, and also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. So after everything, Daniel spends the night in the lion's den. The king asks him if he's okay, and he and he comes out. Uh, sorry, and he comes out all right. He says, "My God hath sent an angel, and hath shut the lion's mouth, and they have not hurt me. For as much as before him innocency was found in me, and also before the king, I have done no hurt." And we see here that God will see us through. Now it's not always guaranteed that He's going to see us through here on this earth. We might just lose the flesh like Stephen to go to heaven. But the thing is, he's never going to leave us nor forsake us. You know, I like both stories for these applications. Stephen was also censored. Stephen was also told not to preach the word of God in the book of Acts. And the difference here is Daniel is seen through, right? He, he's obviously not eaten, and we're going to get to the end of the story there. But, you know, he, God sees him through, and he gets to live out his life. But we also see that Stephen... You know, one of the things that gives me a lot of encouragement about Stephen's story is that as he's being stoned, he's already ascended in the spirit to Christ. You know, God, Jesus Christ stands up to greet him in heaven. 
You know, so even as, as we're suffering in the flesh, we're no longer in our fleshly body. Our spirit's already with Christ. That encourages me because one of the things I grew up with, you know, being from a Hispanic home is paranoia. You know, Hispanics are naturally fearful. Like, they sometimes are too scared of things. It, you know, all you got to do is hang around a Hispanic long enough to know that they're scared of certain things. They'll take risks, but certain risks, right? And, and my family, we always, there was always like this uh, unspoken fear of things. So one of the things that I've had to overcome as I read the Bible is how to get more bold. Because one of the things that my nature wants to do is revert back to fear. Especially when I get around my family and they're like, oh no, if you preach, if you preach like that, they're going to come after you. And they're going to say things to you. And what about your children? And what if they, they kill you and they hurt you? You know, the thing that I do is I just go back to the Word of God and look, God's going to take care of me and He's going to take care of my family. Worst case, if God takes my life, God's going to take care of my family. I have to believe that. Or if not, God's a liar. So we go on the offensive. God will see us through. Go to 2 Timothy 2. Go to 2 Timothy 2, and we're almost done here. Go to 2 Timothy 2, verse 19. Uh, 2 Timothy 2, verse 19 says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. And the servants, I mean, and the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, Instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them to uh, give them repentance to the acknowledging of truth, and what they may and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. And, you know, there's a lot to cover here, but basically we see that if we do certain things, God's going to see us through. Number one, if you're saved, God's going to see you through. Because worst case, even if He has to chastise you, you're going to heaven. So that's not a work. But once you're saved, if you want to really live for Christ and be bold for the Lord, you will, it's not just enough to speak out boldly, but you also got to do certain things so that He's there for you when the attacks come. It, you know, you can't just, it can't just be lip service like people say. It can't just be you know, hot air to, to get a, uh, someone to notice you or to do anything. You have to preach it because you believe it. And God says, look, if you purge your iniquity, if you depart from certain things, then I'm going to be there for you. So God will see you through. When all, next point is, when all is censored, you know, just go back to the original formula. So first I wanted to set this up because this is where I'm going to close in is, you know, there is censorship coming. It exists already. And so what do we do if all of a sudden our Facebook accounts get shut down? Well, I mean, I really think if we can, and if it's possible and you have the time and you can fight it and the energy, we'll create another account. If they shut down your YouTube channel, create another YouTube channel. If they shut down, uh, you know, your radio station or your podcast or your MP3, create another one. But eventually, it's going to get to the point where they're bigger than you are and you don't have the time and energy. You're going to have to decide, do I do the work of the Lord or do I spend my time doing this? Right? And so what... It, when all is censored, when everything is, is, is blocked, which is what's coming when they create this one world government that controls your mind and tells you what to think, the, thing, the only thing that we can do is go back to the original formula, the biblical formula. You know, there's three things that you see in the Bible that nobody can stop. Nobody can stop soul winning because even if they censor it, it's kind of hard to stop a bunch of people knocking doors, even if they threw you in jail. Well, guess what? Or in prison, you can soul win in prison. I mean, seriously, it's not like they can stop you from ever preaching the word of God. The only way to censor you completely is to kill you. Right? They can't stop you from going to church because church is the congregation of the people. So even if they burn this building down or they stop or, or they make us move 
or they make laws that you can only have churches in certain areas, we can always get together. An underground church has always existed throughout history. I mean, that's the reality of life. And the other thing is, they can't stop me from teaching my family about God. They can come and attack. They can threaten. They could even separate, the, separate us. But if we preach the word and give them the foundation, they can't stop the word of God from teaching. You know, I might, I'm never going to complete the work that the Lord's going to complete with my children. But if I teach the foundation, it'll be there. So, you know, uh, I'm there in Luke 10, but you go to Matthew 6. And just to close out the story, because I'm going to give you some verses, but just to close out the story, they censored Daniel. Darius figured it out. God saw them through. And what happened? You know, it says, And the king commanded that they brought those men which had accursed Daniel, and they cast them into the den of lions, them, their children, and their wives, and the lions had the mastery of them, and break all their bones in pieces, and, uh, or every that came out at the bottom of the den. Basically, what happened is Darius was so mad that they manipulated him that he killed the entire princes and presidents and their families and their kids and everybody. And then God's word rang through and true. See, this is why we had to preach God's word even through censorship, because his word will not be censored. We might be censored in one way or another, but God's word will not stop. It says, verse 26, I make a decree. Darius did this. It says that in every dominion of my kingdom, men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is a living God and steadfast forever in his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall even be unto the end. So even Darius recognized that God is the God of the Almighty, the forever God. So we see here, you know, go, go uh, over, let's close this out, go to Mark, I'm in Luke, go to Mark 6, go to, you know, Matthew, Mark, I'm in Luke. It says, after these things, in ver uh, chapter 10 and verse 1, Luke 10, verse 1 says, After these things the Lord appointed other seventy also, and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place, whither he himself would come. Therefore said he unto them, The harvest, is, is, uh, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. For your ways, behold, I send you forth as lamb among wolves. Look, if we're preaching the word of God door to door, if we're soul winning, they cannot censor God's word. I mean, we're going to get God's word into the homes of families if we're leading them to Christ. Because guess what happens? Let's say that, my, that our YouTube channel and our Facebook and everything got shut down tomorrow. Well, you know what? Every time I lead someone to Christ, we give them a Bible. Well, there's a God's word in that house. Every time that I get denied, I leave them the Bible way to heaven. Or I leave them something that says, hey, here's how you find out about how to get saved, there's God's word going into that home. There's God's word. So we had hundreds and hundreds of people just knocking every door. There might not even need, be a need for the social media and the, the TV and the radio and all that. Now there's a place and time for everything, but it's never going to be stopped if we're knocking those doors, right? Imagine if we went into the, uh, the, all the ghettos in, in Houston and just preached the word of God. They don't have to know. As a matter of fact, most people don't know we have a, a YouTube channel. I mean, I think we have something like 98 subscribers. But we've, left, we've led hundreds to the Lord. It's not because of our YouTube channel. I guarantee you that. It's because of our efforts door knocking every weekend, right? Every week, week in and week out, we go out and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's number one, Mark 6, verse 7 says, And he called unto him the twelve and began to send them forth two by two, and gave them power over unclean spirits, and commanded them that they should take nothing for their journey, save a staff only, no script, no bread, no money in their purse. But he shod with sandals, and not, but be shod with sandals, and not put on two coats. And he said unto them, In what place soever ye enter into a house, there abide till ye depart from that place. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear you, when ye depart thence, shake off the dust in your feet for a testimony against them. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for sorrow tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day than judgment in the day of judgment than for that city. Look, what God's saying here is, look, it's soul winning is important, but also don't worry about the people that are trying to stop you. Look, move on. You don't have time for them. Let them worry about their mess. Let them worry about how you, you're preaching. Let them worry about how they think you're evil. Let them worry about that because it's going to be worse for them than it was for Sodom and Gomorrah. 
Acts 5.42 says, And daily in the temple and in every house, they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Hebrews 10.25 says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. For if it were sin, for if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. God says, look, don't stop going to church. Don't. I mean, I've, I've preached here when there's only one person in here. Don't stop going to church. I've just, you know, you just got to keep showing up. He says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves. Don't stop preaching the word of God. Deuteronomy 4, verse 39, and you're gonna, we're going to close out in Daniel 6, so don't, you don't have to turn there. It says, Know therefore this day, and consider it in thy heart, that the Lord, he is God in heaven above, and upon the earth beneath there is none else. Thou shalt keep therefore his statutes and his commandments, which I commanded thee this day, that it may go well with thee, and with thy children after thee, and that thou mayest prolong thy days upon the earth, which the Lord thy God hath given thee forever. He says, look, teach them. He says, know therefore this day, consider in thy heart that the Lord, he is God in heaven, above, uh, above and upon the earth beneath, there is none else. Thou shalt keep therefore his statutes and his commandments, which I commanded thee this day. We know in Deuteronomy, he, teaches, he says, look, teach your family. Have it all over your house. Sing hymns. Sing psalms. Memorize the Bible. Read the Bible. Don't watch the crap on TV. It's not, you know, it's not worth it. As a matter of fact, I'm okay with some censorship. I want to censor the stuff that goes into our home. So if they want to censor me, fine. But they're not going to censor the Word of God. The Bible's been around, and the Bible says it was settled in heaven forever. So before the earth began, the Bible existed. God's Word's been God's Word from the beginning. Right? Go to Daniel, uh, I mean, go to Deuteronomy. Six. Go to Deuteronomy six, and we'll close out. I thought it was Daniel. I I, I abbreviate it, and then we're, we're we're done. Deuteronomy six. While you're turning there, just to remind you, you know, know what you stand for. Know your foundation. Be clear and don't straddle. Understand your enemy. Go on the offensive. God will see you through. You know, you want to be offensive, knowing that God's going to see you through. And when all is censored, just go back to the original formula. Before all of this media, before all of this ability to get the word out and the world became smaller, Jesus sent them out two by two, walking in cities without any electricity, without any phones, without any of the technology. And guess what? They preached the word of God and got people saved. Deuteronomy 6 verse 1 says, Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded you, commanded to teach you, that ye might do them in the land whither ye go to possess it, that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy son's sons, uh, son's son, all the days of thy life, and that thy days may be prolonged. Go to verse 5, and it says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. And these words which I commanded thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when, thy, and when thou risest up. Thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand, and they shall be as frontless between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on thy gate. What is God saying there? I mean, we should just be talking about Jesus and about the Bible all the time. You sit down and eat. Hey, let me tell you about the Bible. You go to bed. Let's talk about God. You wake up. Let's read the Bible. You talk. You know. I mean, it's just constant. We're going on a trip. Let's read. Let's read a story. Let's go over one of the stories in the Bible. You know, salvation is by grace through faith alone. It's not of works. Boom. Just drill it in. Drill it in. Drill it in. Drill. I mean, seriously. How do you teach your, your kids to talk? You hear them, right? And what do you say? Hey, uh, Lucy, say daddy. 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 Say daddy. 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 Da, da. Di, da, da. Daddy, right? What do we do? We teach, God, we teach them God's word. That's what we do. It's repetition. Every day. All the time. Everywhere. God's word. 
That's how we're gonna, you know, beat this. Look, I was gonna, I want to just close out with this. God gives us the increase. We see that in First Corinthians, and for the, the, the sake of time, we we'll actually just go there. First Corinthians three, verse six, and I'm just gonna give you some examples of what's why this was triggered. And I've been thinking about this sermon for a long time, but I, I finally just decided to bite the bullet. First Corinthians three, verse six says, "I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase." So then neither is he planted anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Look, at the end of the day, God's going to give the increase. So are we going to do things for the right reasons or are we going to do them for the wrong? Look, God's going to give us the, the increase. Look, this day and age, there's a group of, of uh, preachers throughout this country that are being censored left and right. There's a group of individuals that call themselves the New Independent Fundamental Baptist. And... You know, it's just a group. They're not a denomination, so I, I don't know. There's no membership card. There's no application. Nothing like that. But if you're part of the, NI, the new IFB, I would consider myself and our church to be part of it. But if they don't consider it, if you're even associated with them, so I can at least say that if, it, if, if nobody thinks that we're part of them, we're definitely associated with them. You know, I, I tend to try to go to some of the events they do, hear some of the preaching, support those pastors. I, I don't have a problem saying I'm associated with them. Some of those individuals I consider my friends. Some of them, they're just acquaintances. Some of them have seen me from far, far off. And if they saw me again, they probably wouldn't know who I was. So I'm not saying that these guys are my best friends or my family, but I will back individuals like this that preach the Word of God. I don't have to know them to know what they preach. I can listen to their, 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 their message. You know, the, the guy that supposedly brought this all together is... Uh, Pastor Steven Anderson. He's what they what what people would say is like the founder of the new independent fundamental Baptist movement. Why is that important? Well, it's just important because at least you know how to pick them out. To me, I don't care if he founded anything. What I care about is that he preaches the word of God. And here's how I know that he preaches the word of God. Because he's not famous. He's famous in the circles of people that follow him, but he's not famous. But he's hated of the world. 33 countries have banned him over the last maybe two, three years. 33. We live in a world where a guy goes out soul winning with his family, runs a church here in the United States in Tempe, Arizona, and because he preaches hard on the sins of the Bible, the world is banning him. You know, I mean, his friend, Pastor Roger Jimenez, I just got back from the Red Hot Preaching Conference in Sacramento. I wanted to go meet these guys and hang out at this. Uh, this is the fourth year they did it. I think he's been banned from a, uh, several countries, but he's famous because in 2016 when the Orlando massacre occurred, he said that we shouldn't feel bad for the 30 pedophiles that got killed. I agree with him. You know, then uh, you have pastors like a Pastor Logan Robertson who got deported from Australia and he ended up being a missionary to the Philippines. You, you, you're not hearing about these guys on the news. You know, we heard about the shootings yesterday. It went, it, the only challenge is that shootings happen every day in, in America. I'm not downplaying the tragedy that happened yesterday. And my soul goes, my compassion goes out for those individuals. I pray that they were saved. But every day in America, people get killed. There's mass shootings every day in America. Every day. The, the media just wants to glorify these for whatever political reason they have. You have a pastor by the name of Oscar Bogard who's actually uh, been threatened to go to jail in South Africa for preaching against the sodomites. He's been in court. And I think they might have even thrown him in jail for a couple of days. And then they constantly attack him all because he preaches the word of God. You know, you got a missionary who got run out of the country. His name is Richard Symes out of the country of the Philippines. And he had to flee with his family because he preached against the biggest false prophet they have there, some guy by the name of Kiboloi or something like that. Because he said that that is a false prophet from the pit of hell. I mean, these are the mighty men. Like David had his mighty men, these are the mighty men of God. You know, you have a, a pastor just here in Houston, Pastor Jonathan Shelley, who preached a great sermon at the Red Hot Preaching Conference, you know, about going to church with all thy might. And there was an article in the L.A. Times about this conference where they're making fun of, the, of Pastor Shelley. And he's had protesters at his church at Steadfast in, in Dallas. You know, you got guys like Pastor David Burns, who's in Atlanta, and he's been on the media because he preached hard against the Sodomites. You got uh, Pastor 
Grayson Fritz, who's a police officer, a county detective, after 20 years with an immaculate record, who had to, <coughs> well, he didn't have to. He left his position as detective because he came out in the media preaching against sodomites. And not just preaching against it, because there's churches that preach against it, but he actually told the whole truth, you know, that they're worthy of death and all this stuff. You got, you know, Pastor David Robinson, you've probably never heard of these guys, who came out on the news too. Why? For preaching the entire word of God. Pastor Tommy McMurtry, they came after him and his family, these sodomites with YouTube. They even made a whole website with all this sickness. I didn't even go on the website, this perverseness, all because he preaches hard against sin. You got Pastor Patrick Boyle in Florida who created, who, who made uh, or put together the Make America Straight Again conference. And when we went there, the media made us look like bad guys, us that were in that building, and they didn't talk about the filthy perverseness that was out there. They didn't, they didn't address it at all. You got individuals like Pastor Cobb who preaches God's word hard here, and he, I've heard people say that they left because they didn't like what he preached. You know, you got individuals that you've never heard of. Man, I just mentioned these pastors, but there's other individuals that I know have been attacked for their faith. They've lost jobs. They've lost money. They've lost family. They've lost friends. You know, I mean, one of the guys, he's not even a pastor. He just puts together uh, movies where he wants to promote the faith. His name's Paul Wittenberger. And when Pastor Anderson got deported from Africa, he was with them. They actually put him in jail for a couple of days before they deported him. Think about it, being in a jail in a foreign country. This is the country we live in. This is the world we live in. So there is going to come a time where the line is drawn. And my prayer is that we stay in the word of God so that we can fight and be found, we have our foundation. So how do you deal with censorship biblically? Well, you know, I didn't want to talk so much about the censorship as, as much as the tools to fight it. You know, know what you stand for. Have your foundation right. Be clear in your message. Understand the enemy. It's, they're going to make it look good. It's not good. Go on the offensive knowing God will see you through. And when it's all said and done, if, if all that fails, the one thing that will never fail is the original formula. Church, soul winning, and your family. Let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for the opportunity uh, to preach here today. Thank you so much, Lord, for those men and women and families that are out there in this country today, Lord, this generation that is willing to not back down on the Word of God. And, and they're willing to do it in, in the midst of uh, trials and of tribulations and of uh, scoffing and of mockings. You know, if you were, well, you we know you read it. You knew it was coming. But if anybody has not read an article like the one, you, you would think that we're like the, the worst people on the face of this earth. I actually thought it was a really good article. You know, an article where it says, well, women were walking around in dresses with their families, pregnant or with babies. Well, that's great taking care of their families. It says, and, and kids were in the, me, in, in the congregation listening to the word of God. Well, it sounds like everything we just read in Deuteronomy. So thank you, Lord, that there's men and women. Thank you that there's men like Pastor Cobb, who is not a new generation, but an older generation that has stood the test of time and that has prolonged his life. And then you've showed us the promise that it's like, the days can be long when you're with God, when you praise the Lord Jesus Christ. So thank you for your son and the salvation by faith through Jesus Christ, and that it's not of works, lest any man should boast. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.